grade 12s, welcome to sketching the graph of a cubic function part 2. Now, when we look at sketching the graph of a cubic function part 2, we're again just going to practice sketching these cubic functions. But I do want you to remember a couple of stuff because we are going to refer to these things slightly more because in this particular one, we are going to talk about the point of inflection. So if you recall in the previous video, I did tell you that you do not have to draw or indicate the point of inflection unless it calls for it. So if the question asks, please indicate the point of inflection, you don't have to do it. But in these particular questions, we are going to look at these points of inflection, and we're also going to look at this whole concept of concavity. So from previous videos, when I discussed the whole second derivative, concavity is indicated by the second derivative. And if the second derivative is positive, the graph is concave up. So pretty much what it looks like is the graph is going to be concave up. And if the second derivative is negative, then the graph is concave down. So the shape looks like that. There the graph is concave down. So this is just a reminder of that video that we had on the second derivative and what the second derivative indicates in terms of the shape of the graph. Right. Then I also want to remind you of your points of inflection. Points of inflection is where the concavity changes. So please remember we can have different points of inflection. If the graph looks like this, so we've discuss that particular shape, then my point of inflection lies over here. By the way, in this particular one, that's a stationary point, that's a stationary point. My point of inflection, which by the way, just for interest sake, is always going to be halfway between these two stationary points or those two turning points. So my point of inflection halfway between these two um, stationary points or turning points is not a stationary point. So in this case, it's just a point of inflection where the graph goes from concave up to concave down. And remember, when it comes to cubic polynomials or the graph of the cubic function, we can set the second derivative equal to zero and that will get us the point of inflection. For the AP Maths people, this does not work for all graphs, but it does definitely work for the cubic function, setting that second derivative equal to zero to find the point of inflection. Now, like I said, the graph could also have the following shape. Again, I have the two turning points over there and there. So that's a turning point, that's a turning point. These are my stationary points. But this is going to be my point of inflection because it goes from concave down to concave up. Now, please note, in this case, my point of inflection is not a stationary point. My point of inflection is located halfway between these two turning points, but in itself, it's not a stationary point. I do have these graphs. The one looks like that, and the one looks like that. This is actually one we drew in the previous video. Now, what happens over here is the following. Instead of having two stationary points or two turning points and one point of inflection, I end up having one point that covers all of this. That one point is my turning point, and it's my point, uh, sorry, not a turning point. Apologies on that one. It's not a turning point because the graph doesn't turn. The gradient doesn't change from negative to positive or positive to negative. That is not a turning point. It is, in fact, a stationary point, but not a turning point. Okay, so that right there is a stationary point, but it's also a point of inflection. So in this case, instead of having these three points, two turning points and a point of inflection, I end up only having one point which is my stationary point, the gradient there is equal to zero, but it's also going to be a point of inflection because the graph changes from concave down to concave up. And there, also same thing, it's a stationary point and a point of inflection because the graph changes from concave up to concave down. So just watch out for this. Right, so let's continue with drawing these graphs. Now in this particular example, example one on page 219, They've given you this graph, fx is equal to x cubed minus 12x squared plus 36x. They've scaffolded it, so we're going to um, go according to the order they've given us here. So not the step-by-step-by-step, -by -step -by -step, the Luzandi method I showed you in the previous one. We're going to stick to the order in the questions. Right, so determine the stationary points. Again, stationary points. We calculate the first derivative by saying 3x squared minus 2 times 12, which is minus 24x plus 36. And in order to get that stationary point, I set the derivative equal to 0. 
Then I'm going to take out 3 as a common factor over there. So that's going to be x squared minus 8x plus 12. And I'm going to divide by 3 there just to make it a little bit easier. So this is going to be x times x, which gives me that x squared. And this is going to be 6 times 2, and it's going to be negative 6 times negative 2 to give me the negative 8x and the 12. So that means I've got the two stationary points where x is equal to 6 or x is equal to 2. There we go. And I'm going to calculate the y-coordinates of those stationary points, again, please, people, by subbing it back into the original equation. Do not calculate y-coordinates by subbing it into the derivative. Derivatives do not give you y-coordinates. Derivatives give you gradients. So I always have to sub back into the original fx in order to get the y-coordinates. Okay, so I'm going to go and say it is 6 cubed minus 12 times 6 squared um, plus 36 times 6. There we go. So this one gives me a y-coordinate of 0. So that is quite interesting. This, the point 6, 0, is not only a stationary point, it's also specifically an x-intercept. So please remember, this is a stationary point and an x-intercept. For those of you guys that don't understand, it's because my y-coordinate is 0. And the moment my y-coordinate is 0, this has got to be an x-intercept. Then I'm going to go and substitute 2 in there, and I'm going to be a bit lazy and just scroll back and change all of these 6s to 2. Save me some time. And that gives me 32. Now, yes, people, I know that's a massive value. This happens quite often with these cubic graphs, where we end up getting these very, very big y values, which means when we draw the graph, we're going to have to watch our scaling. So the scaling on the x-axis can definitely not be the same as the scaling on the y-axis. So I'll talk about that just now when we get to drawing the graph, how to scale it so that everything fits in. So that's the other stationary point, which is the point 2, 30, 2. There we go. So we have our two stationary points. Now just for interest's sake, um, we are going to use the second derivative test just now. So I'll talk about that second derivative test. But... We do know the shape of this graph because I've discussed that in the previous video. My a value is 1, which means a is positive. So that means if I start from right to left, I can draw the graph like a positive a on a parabola, but then I need to add that extra turning point. So that's going to be the shape of the graph. But just to know what they're asking over here, they're asking me, this point that I've got there, is that a maximum or a minimum turning point? And this point, is that a maximum or a minimum turning point? The nice thing is we have this little cheat over there because of the shape of the graph. So because we know what the shape of the graph is, when we do the second derivative test, we can then just refer back to that to make sure we're doing this right. So let me explain the second derivative test to you. The second derivative test is all about concavity. Now please remember concavity that I've discussed in that previous one says, if it's concave up, the second derivative is positive. But if it's concave up, this point has got to be a minimum turning point, as you can see. Now, if it's concave down, then the second derivative is negative. But if it's concave down and the second derivative is negative, this point right there is a maximum turning point. And that's pretty much what they do here with that second derivative test. They want us to use the concavity to check which one of those is the maximum turning point and which one of those is the minimum turning point. So to use that second derivative test, we first have to get the second derivative. So please remember, we're going to get that second derivative by finding the derivative of the first derivative. And careful, careful, please, people. Do not use this simplified version. Always go back to that original first derivative when you want to find the second derivative. So from there, we're going to go and we're going to find the second derivative. So the second derivative is then going to be equal to 6x minus 24. Just to show you, I said it's 2 times 3, which is 6x, make the exponent 1 less, minus 24. So that's my second derivative. Now, to use the second derivative test, we're going to put the x coordinates of those two turning points in there. So I'm going to work out the second derivative where x is equal to 6, and I'm going to work out the second derivative where x is equal to 2. 
And again, I can just use my calculator to do the substitution. So I'm going to go in here, careful. We're going to substitute into the second derivative. 6 times 6 minus 24 is going to give me 12. Now, the value 12 is not actually that important. What is more important is the fact that it's positive. And the fact that it's positive says, because the second derivative where x is equal to 6 is positive, it means it's concave up. And because it's concave up, it means where x is equal to 6, so in other words, the point 6, 0, is a minimum turning point. Because again, when I substituted 6 into the second derivative, it told me it's a positive value. So like I said, the 12 is not important, it's the positive that's important. So it's a positive value, which indicates it's concave up, and because it's concave up, this has got to be a minimum turning point. Now when I sub 2 into that second derivative, being the other stationary point, I can just scroll back, and I can put 2 in there, and that's going to give me negative 12 again. The 12 is not the important thing. The important thing is whether it's positive or negative. So because it's negative, I now know that where x is equal to 2 in this graph, it's concave down, which means the point 232 is then a maximum turning point. And this is how to use that second derivative test so unlike the previous video where we used the first derivative test, this is then how to use the second derivative test in order to establish whether these points are maximum or minimum points. But like I said, we actually knew the shape of the graph right over here by looking at the A value. So because we knew the shape of the graph, we knew that the first point, so the point with a smaller x coordinate 2, we knew this one had to be my maximum point and we knew that the second point, so the point that follows 2, so later on in my number line, so because this is 6, it follows later on, we knew this had to be my minimum based on the shape. But it's good to know that the second derivative test did tell me this is a minimum turning point and this is a maximum turning point. Great. So, now, the next question, just to go again and talk about concavity, they ask, determine when the graph is concave up or concave down. So now, obviously, concave up, and we've spoken about this, concave up is where the second derivative is positive. So I'm going to go and I'm going to use that second derivative that I calculated over here, which is 6x minus 24. I'm going to say it's where 6x minus 24 is greater than 0. And it's a very easy inequality to solve. 6x is greater than 24, and that means x is greater than 4. So where x is greater than 4, the graph is concave up. Now, if you look at this that I drew over there, it means over here, where x is equal to 4, greater than 4, the graph is concave up. And then concave down. That thing, you could work out the entire thing, meaning you could work out, again, where is the second derivative less than 0. But hopefully, logically, you'll understand if it's concave up where x is greater than 4, then it's going to be concave down where x is less than 4. So that's concave up and concave down. Now, here they ask for the points of inflection. So because they ask for the points of inflection of the graph, in this particular example, we are going to indicate the points of inflection that we didn't do in the previous video because it was asked. So point of inflection, I want to remind you, is where the second derivative is equal to 0. Just like stationary points is where the first derivative is equal to 0. So I've already calculated that second derivative, 6x minus 24 equal to 0. And we actually, over here, we already calculated what that point of inflection is, because if you solve this, you'll notice x is equal to 4. And that is going to be the point of inflection, because the point of inflection is where the concavity changes. So where the concavity changes from concave up to concave down, which is at 4, is my point of inflection. Now I am going to, in this case, also work out the y-coordinate of that point of inflection. So I'm going to sub it carefully again into the original equation. Always substitute into the original equation when you want to get a y-coordinate. So into the original equation, I'm going to go and say it's... 4 cubed, 
minus 12 times 4 squared plus 36 times 4. And that's going to give me 16. So that means the point 4, 16, there we go. That is then going to be my point of inflection. And I will indicate that in the diagram. Right, so final question. Draw a sketch of the graph of f. So to draw a sketch of the graph of f, like I warned you guys, we're going to have to be a little bit careful on my scale. Because I need to go and I need to show a turning point, which is at 232. So that means I have to make sure that I don't indicate over here 1, 2, 3, 4, because I have to go to 34, I'm going to run out of space. So please, please be careful with that one. Okay, so there's my x-axis. Luckily, the x-coordinates that I've got for all of these points are fairly small. Um, they're 6, they're 2, they're 4, they're not really big values. So over there, I can stick to a scale of 1. So I can go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. But because I need to get all the way up to 32 over there, and I might have to make this a little bit longer, I think it might actually be a good idea to stick to a scale of 4. So each little tick that I make is going to be 4, 8, 12, 16, like that. So 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, and 32. So that actually is a little bit more useful. So just remember this scale is not indicating 1s. This scale is indicating 4s when I start plotting the values. So the first values I have to plot are the um, stationary points. The first one is at 6, 0. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, there we go, at 6, 0. Um, let me just indicate it over there. And then the other stationary point is at 2, 32. So there's 2, and we showed that 32 is all the way up there, because like I said, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, 32. So I'm going to indicate that as the point 2, 32. Right. Then I'm going to go and I'm going to have to show my x-intercepts. So you'll note we haven't actually calculated the x-intercepts. And please remember you can't draw a sketch graph if you do not indicate the intercepts of the axes. In other words, your x-intercept and your y-intercept. So we will just quickly have to go and say my x-intercept is where x cubed minus 12x squared plus 36x is equal to 0. Now you can use your calculator, but this is actually an easy one because you should note x is a common factor. So I can take out x as a common factor, and I'll have x squared minus 12x plus 36 over here. There we go. Then I'm going to factorize, saying it's x minus 6 and x minus 6, because I need to get to that 36, and minus 6x minus 6x is minus 12. Now this should actually not be a surprise at all. And the reason this is not a surprise is the following. I'm just going to write it like this so you can see. Whenever you solve the x-intercept and you get this result, where you have two x-intercepts that are the same. In other words, x minus 6 is the same as x minus 6. That means we don't have two x-intercepts, sorry, three x-intercepts as we should have. We have two x-intercepts. Why? Because this is not only an x-intercept, that's also a turning point. And we're not surprised to find that because we did calculate the turning point over here as 6, 0, and we also indicated it over there as 6, 0. So this is very, very common when you get two brackets or two roots that are equal. So yes, I'm talking about roots. So two equal roots or two x-intercepts that are the same. It's not just an x-intercept, it's also a turning point. So watch out for that one. Now, the more important one we wanted over here was my other x-intercept, which is at x equal to 0. So I'm going to indicate at x equal to 0, right over there, I have an x-intercept. Now that means I then don't have to go and work out the y-intercept. Because if my x-intercept is 0, my y-intercept is also 0. And besides, if you think about it, my d value over here, there was no d value, which means my d value was 0. So that also indicated my y-intercept being equal to 0. So now, because I did show over here that 6, 0 is a minimum turning point and 2, 32 is a maximum turning point, or because I use my cheat sheet and I know the shape of the graph looks like this because my a value is positive, I can then just go and draw the graph 
through those points. There we go. Doesn't have to be perfect, but like I said, at least try to indicate. Now, I haven't forgotten, don't worry, and I should probably have done that first, but because they asked me to calculate my point of inflection, and my point of inflection I did calculate over here was the point 460. I am going to indicate that point of inflection on the graph. So 1, 2, 3, 4, and this is 4, 8, 12, 16. So actually not bad at all. There is the point 416, which is my point of inflection, which is where the graph changes from concave down to concave up. You don't have to put those arrows in. That's just to show you how that concavity changes. And by the way, I did refer to this previously, but you'll note that this point of inflection will always be halfway between these two x-intercepts. So always halfway between these two x-intercepts. And just, you can check, if I go 2 plus 6 and I divide it by 2, it's 8 divided by 2, which is 4. So if you want to know whether you've done this correctly, you can always check and say, add these two x-coordinates of my um, turning points, which are also my stationary points, and divide it by 2, and halfway always, you will then go and you will get that point of inflection. Right, so that's the example we needed to do for this particular lesson. Obviously, I'm going to give you homework on all of this, and I'm going to make you practice drawing these cubic functions, because in the next video, we're going to be talking about calculations from cubic graphs. So that pretty much is going to be graph interpretation, which means instead of being given the equation and being asked to draw the graph, you're then going to be given the graph and you're going to be asked to find the equation and then also do some other calculations from that graph. So that's why you need to make sure you understand this very, very well, because if you don't know how to draw the graph, it's going to be very difficult to find the equation of the graph and also do other calculations from the graph. So thank you very much for listening.